Kai and I know, have known each other for years. Um, and we were having a little chat about, she has so much experience on both sides of the table, starting businesses, investing in businesses. She's heard as many pitches as I have. Uh, it's amazing how active we get. The more experience we get, the more fun we have. Um, I met her first time it was many, many years ago. Yes. Many, yeah. many years ago. Older, the more uh, fun we have. But uh, I, yes. I'm going to use that. I get more experience. More experienced. <laughs> but we were chatting and I figured out how best, because when you see, hear her speak, she's an incredibly warm, enthusiastic speaker with all of this experience. And I thought, one of my colleagues at Stanford, Tina Selig, has written a book, What I Wish I'd, I, I Knew When I Was 20. And I took a play off that. You always borrow a good idea. What I Wish I Knew Before I Started. And Kaya, I think, according to my, my records, if we pulled this off correctly, you founded your first company in 1983? 82. 82. Trantex yes. Yes. went from a one-person business to over 250 employees with sales of over 10 million. She spent some time in Germany, the US. She's got numerous board memberships, an author. Uh, and importantly for the Alto people, she's well known in the Alto Entrepreneurship Society as a coach in the Startup Sauna program. So it's a great pleasure to welcome back an old and dear friend, Kaya. Kaya Pristi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was very, very nice. Uh, it's intimidating almost. Thank oh. you. No, on the contrary. I mean, I'm here, first of all, to um, share thoughts with you. I don't have any answers for you, because that is what entrepreneurship is about. There's no right answer. You have to find your own way. You have to find your own answers. But, and oh boy, am I in awe when I see what's happening here. There's a design factory. There are people like Peter who are organizing these kinds of courses. And there are things like startup life. So I can tell you, be incredibly happy because you don't know how lucky you are to have all this to support you. I don't say that, okay, it will make life easy because entrepreneurship to me is not even supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be fun and interesting and at times making you almost desperate. But easy, no, because nothing that is good in life is really easy. It has to be challenging. But the things that you have here now are great. And I so appreciate the things that have happened. Because, yeah, I started in 1982. So maybe I should sit in a rocking chair and tell you that now I'm going to tell you ancient history. But things were pretty different then. I can tell you that. And I'm not saying that, oh, yeah, you know, I survived that. But they just were different. Life was different and the world was different. And let's see whether I can get this working. Ooh, yes. So. I'm not talking about me, me, me as such, but to give a little bit of background to why I say the things that I say. Okay, I'm a die-hard engineer. Physics, although I did quantum physics first and then I realized we had an unhappy love affair. We loved each other, but I realized we can't live together. I could never have done it in research. So actually, I, I found operations research when I came to the university after the first year. I didn't know that what it was. So eventually I, I majored in that and uh, did another major in strategic marketing because I am a second generation entrepreneur. So my family had a company, textiles company. And when I was 16, I knew that I knew one thing. That I didn't know what I was going to do when I grew up. But one thing I knew, I was never going to be an entrepreneur. Never, ever in my life. Because I had grown up in a family company, and I said, no way. And so I became an entrepreneur. My father had great time with that. Um, but for me, the thing was that being a second generation entrepreneur, I had seen it all at home. I had no illusions. And this was in 1970s, when in Finland being an entrepreneur was definitely not being a rock star. So uh, basically, that was the time when we all learned at school in history 
that there are different uh, economic systems in the world and you went through them and there was capitalism and eventually there was communism and we would all be happy. So you can imagine what the atmosphere about entrepreneurship was. Uh, anyways, I came to study and uh, I had decided to be a researcher and I even did the nuclear technology eventually. But then I realized that you know organizations are interesting. And it's interesting to see how people work together. And that has been my passion always. Seeing like, hey, how you take different people and have them work together to achieve a goal, do something which actually, at its very best, nobody can say in the end, that was my idea. But all of a sudden there are ideas and the, you start talking together in the group and the idea takes form and it starts moving along and you get this incredibly great flow feeling from working together. And that is what I like. And I'm extremely interested, therefore, in social business design, what it's called now, and collaboration solutions. And uh, there was an opportunity, quite frankly, um, at that time, there was an ad in the university saying, okay, a company was looking for somebody to do translations. Because remember, oh, by the way, who in here was not born at 1982? I'm just curious. Great, yes, guys, I'm really old. I went to the university at the time when there were no screens for computers. There was this teletipper uh, thing where w which we used that had paper. I mean, honestly, these things didn't exist. 1982 was the year when IBM PC came to the market. And what happened was that that created a completely new need. Because before that, in the good old times of old computers, which were mainframes, they didn't need any translations. Actually, I was told by everybody, but nobody needs translations in computers and software. It has to be in English, of course, because computer people only spoke English. That was enough. PC came and changed the world, and it really caused the disruption. So all of a sudden, there were secretaries who had to use word processing, and there were people who used Excel, and all of a sudden, these people wanted to have instructions in Finnish. So, I started thinking, hold on, this is going to change a lot. And you had translators, and do you know how translators worked in 1982? They dictated the translation, or they wrote it with a typewriter machine on duplicate or triplicate copies with carbon copies. I mean, we go way back. This existed. I be believe you, me. I'm ancient history. I feel like, you know, diplodocus or something like that sometimes. But it's fun. Because think about it. At the same time, I'm 52, and I like to think that it's marvelous to see how big changes there have been in the world. And there are other changes. In 1991, I published a book. I did that as a hobby called Costing the Earth. That was the first book written by an economist about the fact that environment is not just a cost, which in 1991, uh, when I published it, all the Finnish paper companies were saying, this is going to kill us, this environmental thing, and this is terrible, and you know, oh, those environmentalists are the worst, worst vermin in the world. And this is a terrible cost. And this lady, Frances Kencross of The Economist, wrote a book saying, actually, environment is going to be big business, and we can see that as a business opportunity, too. This was in 1991, not that long ago. Now everything is green, and we talk about clean tech. And I can tell you that in 91, we didn't talk about clean tech. So things change. And so anyways, I saw that there is an opportunity, and there I was, uh, a student in the University of Technology, and decided that this is interesting, combining the language. Translators don't know anything about IT, IT people were not able to write comprehensible Finnish, and they didn't want to do it anyways, and I thought, ah, this is a place where there is a chasm, and you can build a bridge over it. I wasn't a translator, but I thought this is an interesting process, and hey, process optimization, that I knew. So there I went, and um, started doing the business, and not just like I, I was very lucky 
from the very beginning to start getting people around me. Who did I hire? Students from the university. We had fun. We really had fun. But I also hired, started hiring totally different people, people with background in Finnish language so that they could write very well and teach the students how to write very well, and then subject matter experts. And gradually it grew. I also started working Im immediately with a bigger company because, hey, I was a student. I didn't want to put a lot of uh, investment at that time. My father never invested in the company or anything, and we didn't have a big family company. But what I had at home was my father, whom I could trust absolutely, and who was my mentor. In 1982, there was nothing almost in Aalto, in Aalto or TKK, or what it was at that, that time to teach you about entrepreneurship. There was Professor Martti Kaila, whom I hold in great esteem because he had a lecture series about business. And that was practically the only thing. Otherwise, you were supposed to graduate and go to work for a big company. And for the first five years, I was always answering the question of why did you waste your education? I thought that I didn't waste my education, and I actually still think that scientific education is one of the best bases for business. Two main reasons. You learn to really understand the differentiation between caus causality and correlation, and it's very good to understand that in business too. And you learn to understand what Occam's razor means. In business, the same principle is called KISS, keep it simple, stupid, and it actually does work. So it's good to remember those things. And so, the world was completely different. You were not supposed to go to startups. There weren't, I mean, we were not talking about startups. Why I went there, not because I'm saying like, hey, you know, I was so great. I actually, I, I have a tendency of always saying that, okay, I, I tend to go a little bit against the current because I was very much about startups then, and now when everybody is about startups, my greatest passion at the moment is uh, Finnish machinery companies and traditional companies, because wow, they are really interesting, and there's a lot of skills there, a lot of innovation. And I have to say that I start hating the fact that sometimes in media they say innovation happens like in IT startups. Baloney, go to Ponce and think that there was a guy, do you know what Ponce says? For those who, who don't know, there was this guy in the middle of the Finnish forest with very little like formal education who went and designed this kind of a incredibly, event nowadays incredibly sophisticated machine to cut trees. And if somebody tells me that that's not innovation, I think that it's actually even more innovative than somebody with a very high level education doing stuff because you are in a better position when you have a high level education very often. So yeah, there are incredibly interesting companies in Finland and I think that we should pay much more attention to those companies that actually manufacture things, have been there for quite a long time, employ 50 to 200 to 500 people, and can offer incredible opportunities. So, even if you decide to become an entrepreneur, and I think that it's a wonderful thing, it is one alternative to you. Look also as one possibility to these kind of companies that can really use your innovativeness and who can use you to bring up totally new things in the world. So becoming an entrepreneur is great, but it's not the only, only solution in the world, and it's not like, oh, it's better to become an entrepreneur. It's very fascinating. And it means, with li it means living with uncertainty. You enjoy it, or you learn to live with it, or you hate it. And when you are an entrepreneur, normally you feel all those things within one day, maybe several times, and so on. So that happens too. Being an entrepreneur, I know that in Aalto they say that we want to make entrepreneurs the rock stars. Fine if we are talking about we should change the attitude. But at the same time, I do want to say that it is one choice. The nice thing is that now it's considered as a positive choice. And the other nice thing is that when I became an entrepreneur, the atmosphere was that there were two possible conclusions, death or bankruptcy. You became an entrepreneur and it was a one-way street. Now it isn't. You become an entrepreneur, you, you can become a serial entrepreneur. You start up your company and then you go and work for a bigger company or you 
have a company and you work for a bigger company at the same time and you can do many things at the same time and I absolutely love it because now we are no longer put in this one box. You are, you have a uh, Master of Sciences from Technology. You work in this kind of a big corporation and that's it. You have worked your the per first 10 years in, say, IT industry. You will stay in the IT industry. Actually, we have realized that we can change and that's marvelous because life is way too short and too valuable to be boxed in. Don't ever let anybody do it for you, to you. But this is also the reality we are living in. Not wanting to be negative, but hey, big companies are laying off people like mad at the moment, which is extremely sad, but life has changed. So that means that starting a, a company, becoming an entrepreneur, is an alternative, sometimes it's even a necessity, because you can't find a job otherwise. But it's al also a very, very good experience. And I think that one of these changes is that we do not rely anymore on, hey, I go to a big company and I stay there for life. And you could say, well, that's obvious. Again, like I said, in 1980s, that was still the thing you did. And I was in one conference where J.P. Rangaswamy said very well that my father, had one job for life. I, my age, I have had like five jobs over my lifetime. And I look at my son and he will have five jobs consecutively at the same time. I'm sorry. So, you know, he's doing all these different things all the time. So things change. And so that's why becoming an entrepreneur is a possibility. And now I'll go through some ideas. And I do want this to be interactive because as I said, for me, I didn't become an entrepreneur because I was so darn smart and so on. I had the background. I was the second generation uh, entrepreneur. I had my father, whom I could ask, and my mother also, but uh, even more so my father, whom I could ask things and whom I could trust that he gave me good advice, which is why it's so good that you have coaches and you have places where you can go and talk to people who are, you, who are not trying to sell you something, who are not trying to kind of a, uh, get into your company as, oh, I will do all kinds of things for 10% of your company, or who are not actually your competitors and trying to backstab you, because you'll find them too. But it's wonderful to have places where you can share, because that's the most valuable thing you have when you are an entrepreneur. So... I will really want to have discussion here, but there are a few thoughts, seven of them, that I want to go through, not the seven deadly sins, but seven random thoughts when I was saying, I wish I had known when I started. These are partly them and partly like over these 30 plus years, I've really learned to appreciate this. And the first is the importance of team. Chemistries need to work at least in the beginning. And if they don't, don't go into it. Things change over life. You may start a company with people, and then things change, and you realize you don't work well together. And also, when the company grows, you need new kinds of people. And one of the sad things that I still see is that People form a company and then they're like, I'm the CEO and I need to be the CEO. And then the company grows, hopefully, and, and when it starts growing, you realize that you need new kind of talent and you have to let go. And you have to say that, okay, we need a new CEO. And I think we are getting better at this, but it still is there. Because becoming an entrepreneur, to me, is still that it's about the company. You are building the company. And if you see that it's better for the company to get a new... If you are the CEO, but it would be better for the company to have somebody else to be the CEO, you have to be the first one who says, yeah, we need to get a CEO because it is about the company first and foremost. If you want to have a career path, don't become an entrepreneur. Because it's not a career path. It is building a company doing the things for the company, trying to hire people who, uh, or get, not even hire, get people into the company who are smarter than you or who can do things in their own area better. And it is about appreciating the team. 
I think that we still have, and that's one of the things why when I say entrepreneurs, we make entrepreneurs into rock stars, I'm saying actually no, because some of the rock stars can be rather obnoxious and they can be about me, me, me. When you are an entrepreneur, you have to learn to appreciate the team, you have to learn to motivate the team, you have to learn to reward the team, because otherwise you'll end up as a one-person company, and then that doesn't grow. I know that there's Steve Jobs, who was an obnoxious and terrible person and everything like that, and still widely successful. He was a special visionary, and there are people who actually want to wa work to with a person like that even though they were saying that he was horrible, but because his vision gave them so much. And in a strange way, maybe he did appreciate the team. But to me, the thing is that the team is really, really important. So find a good team where you feel like, okay, this works, you get appreciated, and you appreciate the other members in the team. The importance of shareholders agreement. When you start a company and this is one if you remember one piece of advice if you become an entrepreneur and you start with others the team is important and do a shareholders agreement with them from the very beginning because things change in life and if you agree in the beginning in a simple way i'm not talking about a 30 page agreement where you try to define absolutely every possible thing that happens i'm a mathematician i love algorithms so a basic algorithm okay we start working together. If you leave, what will happen? And I strongly suggest that you put in a clause where if somebody leaves, they have to offer back their shares, or at least part of the shares. Because I have been cleaning, now sitting in boards and cleaning up companies with no shareholder agreements, with incredible amount of passive shareholders, and in worst case, even antagonistic shareholders. That happens. That's life. You cannot know what things are five years from now, but you can say, hey, we are in this together. If you all work together, the Mika Marialaks actually blogged in Arctic Startup also about the free rider thing. As I said, don't make it too complicated, but it's also a good acid test. If you are in a team and you cannot in the beginning even agree on the shareholders' agreement, maybe there are some other issues in the team too, so it might be a good idea to reconsider the team. Funding. Okay, you're a startup. This is always the issue. Funding, funding, funding. Who will pay your salary? So you will think about, okay, how do I get public money? How do I get angel investors? How do I get VCs? And Oh, by the way, there's a thing called customers. My goodness, they pay for the stuff you are doing. Actually, or at least they should be. I belong to the very old-fashioned entrepreneur group. We actually believe that customers eventually should be paying for the work we do. I know. I know very well that there have been some incredible success stories where a company never made one penny of money and still managed to do a great exit. And I also am old enough to remember when we had this new economy thing. It was in the uh, beginning of the 90s, yeah, when people were there, were several business people saying, OK, we will never make any money with this company and we are going to do this incredible exit. And I also remember the famous bank manager who said that the price of real estate can go up infinitely. And I was saying the mathematician in me was like, OK, I don't believe that. <laughs> we are going to be in a lot of trouble, but OK. Um, so yeah, there are customers. And I do think that, yes, it's important to think of funding. It's very good that we have public funding, and it's good to do the funding pitches and so on. And yes, there are many cases where you really need investor money, but always think of who is going to be a paying customer. I, as a tiny angel investor, I do small angel investments, but that is what I look at always. And I, I don't even pretend to be, you know, I, I'm unable to see the opportunities where the company says, oh, we are not going to make money, but we are going to make an exit. I can understand that it's there, but I still have problems to uh, understand. When you become an entrepreneur, you need to focus, and then you need to focus, and then you need to focus more, and then you need to learn how to pivot. So. Sorry, focus does not mean that you sit and plan for one year and because you know best. But focus is that you think of your idea, you believe in it, 
And then you think, you know, what can I offer to the customers? And if you think of 10 features that you could offer, you throw eight away, and then you focus on the two, and you choose which one you execute. Because if you are a team of three, or even five, you will most likely not be able to execute the 10 features properly. Focus on the one that is the most important to your customer. Execute that, make sure that that works. And also, by the way, customers want simpler solutions than you think. Also, customers want to buy things that are easy to understand, that address their needs. I was coaching one company who had developed this lovely software, and they showed me a slide where there were like, if I remember correctly, 23 different things that the software did and went through that. And then when they finished, I said, ooh, I'm in awe. I mean, this sounds great. Actually, I'm convinced that your software probably will make coffee for me in the morning. But I don't understand any more, anything anymore about it, because I'm totally confused. I thought that I had this need, and now you have come up with the 23 things you can do. And I'm kind of a, yeah, wow. And I'm so confused that I don't even want to buy it anymore, because I got so many ideas about what do I want to buy. So customers, <laughs> they have a short period. They have a specific need. Fulfill first one need, and then start thinking about additional features. Bec besides, that's a great way of sort of extending the life period of your company, because you can come up with new features. And the customers are right. They do pay your salary. So what do you do then? You focus, you focus, you focus, and you believe in what you do. You have to be the person who really believes in the features you do. You also have to be the person who can every single day ask, is this the right thing? who always is asking, why, 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 how can I do this better? It helps to be a schizophrenic, to be an entrepreneur, because you have to believe in what you do, and you have to be the one who also questions it all the time. It's not personal. One thing to remember is that as an entrepreneur, you have to be able to take no for an answer, like 70 times a day. Not saying like, oh, you people are stupid, you don't understand my great idea, but saying, OK, fine. He said, no, why? How can I, is there something that I should change? You have to re-evaluate and re-evaluate, and you have to be able to pivot. Do you know what pivoting means? Pivoting means that you, yes, pivot means like this, turn, and in business it means that you start doing something, and you realize that, okay, the customers are not buying this, but aha, they might be interested in that feature. Famous examples that happen. Um, I think it was Honda who came up with the small motorbikes. And they had actually designed a really big motorbike for the US market. And then their sales guys were going to sales meetings with the small motorbikes, which they were not even planning to sell. Nobody wanted to buy the big motorbikes, but then the customers were saying, hey, that's a cute thing. And I really like that one. And there are so many. I think Blast was the one that uh, recently in Finland who had actually designed a totally different software, but then to s uh, aid their salespeople, they had developed a piece of code. And then when they were showing their solution, the customers were saying, oh, that's not interesting, but that you are using is really interesting. And so they built things up from that. So things happen, and you have to be able to follow that. So that's why it's interesting. We always say, and in all these courses, you are told, focus, focus, focus. And that's absolutely correct, but it doesn't mean that you stick to this, that, okay, I'm going to do this, and if nobody is going to buy it, everybody is wrong. There may be the slight chance that the one who's wrong is you and not the entire rest of the world. Of course, that's maybe, maybe not. But you have to listen. And so you have to be able to change, to look at the opportunity and see, okay, do you have to change your message, do you have to change your service, and so on, because eventually the customers choose. And they don't always choose the best product, but they choose the one that they want to buy. So sorry, it's not a fair world. You, you are not awarded prizes and you are not awarded grades like at school. At school, you get all the answers right in the exam and you get a 10 in Finland in the business. You get everything right. And your competitor has a lousy product, but the customers buy for it. Sorry, 
that's how it goes. Uh, there's never enough time. This is life in startups. Oh dear, if only there was time. We always had, uh, oh, in many companies, we joke that okay, when the delivery date is the 30, uh, let's say 31st of August, luckily enough, there's always the 32nd of August and the 33rd of August. Sometimes there is a um, Beethoven uh, opera where they also have that extra day in December. Um, you are always, when you are a startup and you start growing, the unfortunate thing is that you are always running low on time, you're running low on resources because you can't hire all the people you would need and you want to sell, 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 and then you get the customer and then you are there and you need to execute and at the same time you should sell more to get more customers and so on. So yeah, it's, it's a great experiment in learning how to prioritize and how to try to manage your life so that all the hours actually are there to do the stuff. Sometimes it's really hard on your family. Uh, I belong to the group that, as I said, I grew up in a family business. And so I also had a business with my husband. Well, I mean, we got married after we sold the business, but we were living together already at that time. And there are people who say that, okay, that would be the last thing that they would do, have a family business. And I agree. I don't necessarily re recommend it to anybody, but it can be fun too. There are people who say, oh, you know, if you are working, if you have a start a company with your spouse, you have to, you know, learn not to bring home to work and work to home. That may be the case. I actually believe the opposite because you can't stop them from home comes to work and work comes to home, but you get darn good at solving any arguments very, very quickly because otherwise you can't work through it or everybody else gets mad around you or, or crazy. Get used to surprises. A couple of things. Um, I think here also, unfortunately, people are getting better. But over the years, especially when I've been talking to people who come from more from academia, it's like sale is done when the money is in the bank. And sometimes there are customers who buy and don't pay the bill. And that happens too. Not people out there are not all people out there are nice. So there will be backstabbing. There will be very bad behavior from competitors. There will be extremely bad behavior from your customers. Unfortunate, but still you just have to continue to do what you believe in. And you have to continue to run a tight ship. Because this is the one thing that in startups, and, and again, I don't want to be negative, but when you have a startup, there are many companies out there also who say, oh, okay, a startup, well, we'll pay their bill whenever we feel like that. And you have to be there and say, okay, sorry, you haven't paid your bill. You have to pay it or we stop working and so on. And that will take time. And if you don't do it, you give a signal to your customers that, oh, okay, the guys don't care, so, you know, if they say you have to pay in 30 days, we'll pay in 90 days, and that may kill you. So you still have to do the nitty-gritty of the business. Don't trust on the fact that, oh, okay, I did the work and I sent the invoice in and the customer will pay. And when times are like this, what they currently are, trust me, the customers will not pay. On the contrary, they actually go through their invoices to be paid and say, oh, okay, we'll pay those guys later. They, they are too small. They can't complain. So that happens. You just have to s continue monitoring things and so on. And yes, as I said, it does take time. So being an entrepreneur isn't just creating wonderful creative things and products and talking with customers. It is about the nitty gritty and seeing whether there's enough cash in the bank and whether the customers are paying and are you paying things and so on. And the boring stuff, but the absolutely essential stuff that you have to do also. And the majority of startups will fail. That's true. Luckily enough, as I said, nowadays, it's not like, okay, that's it. I am in debt for the rest of my life and can do nothing. And that is one of the great things that has changed here. Because like I said, in 80s, it was still that, okay, if you failed, you were marked for life practically. 
Nowadays, it is okay. All right, I do want to say, though, that when you become an entrepreneur, I think that you have to have responsibility, especially if you take other people's money. And there now I am critical that I've seen a little bit of this tendency of, oh, well, you know, you just collect investors' money and you try out, and if things don't work, well, you know, you can always go and do something else. True, but the attitude is wrong. You try your hardest when you are there, especially if you have taken investors' money because you are responsible for them. Nobody blames you if you fail, but you tried. But if you go in with an attitude of, hey, you know, other people's money, OPM, nicest funding there is in the world, it's not like that, because those investors have done a lot of work to get that money, and they do invest in you because they trust in you. So don't treat it light. Treat it with the respect and treat it with, hey, we are going to try and succeed. I know that there are bad, there are nasty investors maybe out there and you may say that, oh, they want to have absolutely horrible terms and you should negotiate the terms that you can live with. But never ever have an attitude of, oh, well, you know, we'll try and if it doesn't work well, the investors lose their money because eventually, you know, you will start losing. Some companies are spectacularly successful, some are doing okay, who will succeed? Who will not? I think that there is no absolute yardstick for success. And in hindsight, we can say, oh, yes, that company was successful. And yes, you can do a lot of things to improve your chances of becoming successful. But let's face it, luck has to do with things. I mean, a couple of, in Trantex time, a couple of the biggest deals I did was that I happened to sit in a plane beside a person, and me being a quiet and shy person, you know, started talking with that person, and you know, we started chatting and things led to one another. Was that luck? Yes. Was that the fact that you give luck a chance? Yes, just as much. So either you sit there and write your own business plan and never talk to anybody who's sitting beside you, or you chat and see, oh, okay, maybe you still write, you still have time to write part of your business plan, but you talk to people because, after all, business is something done by people, between people, still. No matter how much we live in the internet, no matter how much we say, oh, we do things electronically, we are still people. And before we start questions, that is the final thing I would like to remind you. This is about people. This is about meaningful life. If you want to become an entrepreneur because you want to make a ton of money, go ahead. If that's what makes you happy in life, that's fine. However, really think, well, what does make you happy in life? And having a ton of money not necessarily is the only thing to make you happy. Also, um, who of you have seen The Godfather 3? Remember the part where Al Pacino, when he's getting old, he says, not quite verbatim, but he says, I've tried so hard to make my family respectful, but the, ho the higher I get in the society, the worse it becomes, because he is surrounded by politicians and people who he says that are much worse than mafia. So that can happen too. Go and change the world, somehow, and then, Rewards, various rewards come from that. But eventually it is about how we live our lives and what changes we make. They are our own, and as I said, if making a ton of money makes you happy and is your goal, great. But then ask yourself, what am I going to do with that money? What good did I do for the world with that money? And then you choose your answers, because they are your answers. Those were the random thoughts. Now. As I said, ask me questions, contradict me, say that none of that makes any sense, and then we'll have a good debate. Yeah. <laughs> Question. There must be some. Yes. No, I mean, okay. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, what was your trigger uh, to become, what was the trigger uh, uh, to become an entrepreneur for you? What was... 
thing why I wanted to become an entrepreneur. I think that I, uh, in 1980s, I realized very soon that I can't work for a star big company. Uh, sit there and say, yes, 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 because I would always say, why? Why are we doing this? Um, in, the com in the first company, Trantex, uh, our vision and mission were two words. Why not? Because we thought long and hard about, you know, we wrote, um, and, and why it is also we. I couldn't tell you who it was who came up with those words. There was a group of us, we did a lot of things so that the whole company participated, even when there were 250 of us. And we were in a meeting and we said, we need to come up with a vision, and everybody was coming up, and we started with the normal, we want to provide the best quality translation and localization services, etc., etc., and it was like 20 lines long, and so on and so forth. And then we were talking about, okay, well, what is it really important for us, and what do we want to convey, and so on, and eventually out came, hey, what are we about? This company is about why not? Because that was what we always wanted to say to our own people, to our customers, think differently a bit. Never say, oh, we'll do this and jump to everything, you know, like, like a puppy wagging its tail and saying, yeah, yeah, sure, we do everything, no matter what it costs, because it's a business. But never say no. Say, why not? And then see what comes out of that. So um, that, and uh, as I said to me, I was, I was absolutely fascinated about seeing how teams work together instead of, you know, working by yourself. And I also believe very much in new types of organizations, not the hierarchical organization, but a very flat organization where people really work together. So actually that was my biggest reason to do that because I looked around and felt, okay, I don't see that kind of an organization where I would work. So let's create one myself. <laughs> <laughs> and see what happens. And, uh, and the other thing was that I, I saw the gap, as I said. And, and that's the other thing that has always fascinated me. Like seeing a total new opportunity open up. And then see, okay, you know, would that work? Why not? Like, that could be an opportunity. And then also, um, then when it started, I was, as I said, I was tremendously lucky to have a great team early on, and really nice people, and we liked working together, and so on. So even though there were long hours and so on, we also fought together a lot, but we could fight together. So we, we didn't agree on everything on the contrary, but we could disagree, and that was great. And there were really tough customers and things like that, but there were it, it was something that was new. Basically, I'm a physicist by training, so I love everything that's new. I'm, I'm endlessly curious, so I saw that, okay, I would, I, in term, financial terms, probably would have made more money by going to a big company and so on, but I couldn't see myself building a career because I love building companies or participating in building companies. The company becomes an ent entity, and that's fascinating. Other questions? Come on, like I said, now you can, this is about mentoring. Ask anything that you have had in mind. I don't answer. I give you additional ideas. Yeah. Okay, so after all those years of making companies, mm. um, how still can you doing say, that. Still doing yeah. it. How can you say, what is the main factor that actually make entrepreneurs successful? I mean, it's some mm. kind of luck, skills, connections to people, or hard working. Mm. Okay, um, first of all, what is success? As I said, first you have to define success. I know entrepreneurs who have made tons of money. Uh, and that I is actually yeah. don't, uh, I don't talk about money, but yeah. about some general state of success. Yeah. Okay, uh, fine. I think that if entrepreneurs who feel that they have made a difference and they are satisfied with their life, they are successful. And for some, it means making a lot of money. But I think that then how you become so successful, as I said, luck does have to do with it. There are, I, uh, I know, and I have been involved with some companies where I really kind of could say that, hey, everything else was right, but the timing was completely wrong. So either we were just too early or um, in, in the wrong place, or we just couldn't get to the right market, or we couldn't wait long enough, 
to see that, okay, there would have been the opportunity. Or just too small. And we were unable to convince investors to put in more money and so on. Um, but basic things are, I, I, to me, curiosity. And, and as I said, this schizophrenic, slightly schizophrenic ability to at the same time believe strongly in what you are doing and being able to question it all the time without it becoming sort of a personal burden. But it, to me, it's also part of curiosity. And then tenacity. You know, like you, you, you go on, you don't give up easily. You just kind of say, okay, right, well, you know, didn't work. So that, as I said, you have to be able to take no for an answer like seven times or 200 times a day and not say like, Ugh, oh my God, you know, this is awful. You kind of say, oh, okay, well, could I change this? Could I change this? And uh, maybe it goes back to the curiosity factor, but the, uh, the kind of that in a, well, what I said in the beginning also, ability to live with uncertainty and see actually enjoy it more than be troubled about that. So I think that that is one of the things that I see in many entrepreneurs. They may be, some of them are sort of a really, really focused and, and see only one thing, like they are the kind of people that, you know, if they have a hammer, everything is nails, but they go on and, and they find enough nails to, to do it successful. But yeah, I, I think that tenacity, and if you are, the, the really important part, if you want to create a growth company to me, is that you know how to appreciate and motivate the team somehow. Because uh, in various ways, the, the kind of team that, yeah, that you really can uh, grow a team and make that team work together. Because that's the only way you grow. Otherwise, like I said, you become a one-person company. And then there are problems of scaling that. Although that can be good too. I'm not saying that that's absolutely, you know, like, oh, don't become. It can. I actually, again, I come back to I hate this one truth. And we tend to be a little bit of a country where there's one truth at a time. Either there are big companies that are great, or then there are startups that are great. And I'm saying, well, you know, there's everything there in between. And enjoy that. And, um, you know, if we say that, oh, startups, we all need startups, we will have a country that has like 50,000 one person companies or 500,000 or 2 million one person companies. I mean, hey, if companies grow, they need to be able to also hire people. I do believe strongly in growth companies that you also take people in by giving them ownership, key people stay more key people if they get ownership, not free riders, but they have a stake in the company. But yeah, you, you still you don't have to start your own company every single time. You can really enjoy working in another company in different ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, from more practical mm -hmm. point of view, uh, how do you think which skills or abilities should potential entrepreneur improve? What to skill up to be a good entrepreneur? To improve, well, the nitty-gritty part, that you have to be able to take care of that too. Um, going back to, I mean, if y becoming an entrepreneur, yes, it does help if you are extrovert, because you can't do things by yourself. So yes, it is good to be able to talk with people and to listen to people. Actually, I think that we are, we are putting a lot of uh, emphasis on you have to be able to do the pitch and so on. Well, it's just as important for the entrepreneur to know how to listen. Nobody wants to. I mean, a successful entrepreneur is not a person who just sort of, this is my message, this is my message, I don't listen to you. You have to really learn how to listen. And I think, okay, areas of improvement, very concrete stuff now, going back to when I coach. Um, what I still see, and I'm an engineer, so I'm allowed to see it. Engineers love features. They just absolutely love features, and they love the technology, and they still start saying, our product, our service does this and this and this and this. And I say, hey, which need does your product or service solve for a customer? Because that is what it is about. And it sounds, sometimes I feel, though for heaven's sakes, you know, this sounds silly. But it still goes from that. You have to start from the customer need, whether an existing need or a future need that you can build. 
But it is not about your products or services features. It is about solving the customer needs. The other thing, competitor analysis. Seriously, guys, um, you have to look at, okay, what is being done there already? And again, this is sometimes I feel that this has been taught at the universities like for 30 years and still, 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 I see lousy competitor analysis. Like just today, I was reading one business plan which was like, we are unique, or at least we don't know about our competitors. And I spent two minutes in Google and I said, okay, right. I can say, because there's this great uh, text by Guy Kawasaki um, in Harvard Business Review, the 10 sins of entrepreneurs, and I think it's sin number five, where it says we have no competition, and Kawasaki's answer is either there's no market or you don't know how to use Google. The, the point is that very seldom do you get in a position where there, okay, is no competition because there's no existing market yet, but you create it. Yes, you could say, you know, iPhone was that, and yes, there are places. And there are sometimes great innovations and the black swans that happen. But still there normally, if you can't kind of, a, even for iPhone and things like that, there was a future need. There was a need that you could express that it fulfilled. But yeah, those, those two, definitely. And then the nitty gritty part. I mean, you still have to do the boring stuff of paperwork and managing the bills and so on. And if you don't want to do it, well, you know, sorry, but somebody has to do it. And you better know it. If you are the owner, you have to know your cash flow and you have to know how much money you are making and so on and so forth, even if you don't do the numbers yourself. Yes. Uh, actually, I have a question mm -hmm. for which I would like you to answer in yes or no. Oh, impossible for me, as you have because noticed. <laughs> because there are too many. I'll say maybe. There are too many yeah. explanations for that question. Okay. When I was listening to your uh, presentation, the first point you said that you got a good team. Mm -hmm. And, and the, at the last of your presentation, you said that you were lucky in getting, your, in getting a good team. Mm. What do you think, how much part luck plays in getting a good career in entrepreneurship? I can't answer yes or no to that. You said how much does uh, no. it make? Uh, because okay. Because, <laughs> I have, because personally, I have it, uh, yes. listened to... Mm different entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and I feel yeah. that luck has a lot of part to play in it. Sorry, you have? I feel that luck has a lot of part to play in it Yes. Uh, in parallel to other capabilities yeah. which you have. Yes. I, I think that, yes, luck has to do with that. But again, I would say that, okay, um, when we say, oh, somebody was lucky, then it can also, you can improve yeah. your luck being, ability to be lucky by being sort of more receptive to things and so on. And, and sort of uh, discussing with the team openly, looking around and so on, sort of really talking with the people instead of saying, okay, here we are, here's the team. And, you know, there are all these thoughts in the back of my mind that sort of bother me, but I won't talk about them. No, don't do that. So you can kind of, as I said, you can do all kinds of acid tests to see whether the team works. But yes, you know, I think that, and that's why I am saying that I, I don't ever want to talk about, oh, yes, you know, I was such a great entrepreneur because I've made so many mistakes anyways. And, uh, and that's part of it. And I'm not saying that, oh, you know, I had all the right answers because there were things where I really feel like, hey, I, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. I also happened, in some cases, open my mouth in the right time. And in some cases, I happened to keep my mouth closed in the right time. So um, it is about seeing the opportunities and being receptive to the opportunities. But, yes, you know, still luck has to do with that. Even when building the team, even when doing that, and, and that's the way it is. Okay. You, as I said, you can improve your chances, but the luck, luck factor is there. Yes? Um, what you were saying about the why not strategy mm -hmm. actually reminded me of a discussion we had in a strategy class mm -hmm. in the morning that what is strategy mm -hmm. and the um, teacher was saying that um, from an entrepreneurial perspective, they don't necessarily come up with a strategy. They say, let's do it, and then strategy yes. kind of develops. Yes. And I was wondering, do you agree with that, or yes. what's your take on that? So okay. Do you um, need to yeah. bother with business plans and strategic visions and missions before you come up with a company, or...? <laughs> 
Yes. All right. Um. To me, uh, I there's this you know the rise and fall of strategic planning book and so on. I think that when you are a small startup, um, you should not sort of uh, start going spending ages and ages on you know this is what we are going to do and so on. But um, you should think of how do I do these things? How am I going to do things? And why am I doing them? Because what am I doing is changing. But the how am I going to do? Like, am I going to strive for really good quality or, uh, you know, customer satisfaction or, or these kinds of things? How? How am I building the team? How am I rewarding the team and so on? Because that stays. And that is the cornerstone of your corporate company's identity. And also why, you know, like why are we doing this? And I think that is the one thing that especially the founders of the company should be very truthful about that. You know, why are we starting this company? Because we have no other choice. Because after five years, we all want to have a yacht uh, and, and make a lot of money. I mean, honestly, there are people who kind of say, oh, you know, we do crappy code and try to sell it to some sucker who doesn't understand better. That happens too. But you have to be, uh, to me, it's about being honest with what you want. And by the way, one of the things which in startups um, I'd, I'd like to see more, and I, I advise them, is that when I said shareholders' agreement, also write what is the goal of the founders and the owners. What are they thinking of they are doing? Is this something that's going to pay my salary? Is this something that I want? I really would like to do an exit and review that once a year. Sit down and say, well, what do we want now? Instead of sort of doing this massive strategic planning, and oh, by the way, <laughs> one of the things, and this has improved also a lot, but I, I much more seldom see any more business plans with the nice three-year projections of sales where the third year sales is 7,275,819 euros and 32 cents because Excel is so good at doing that. A very dear investor friend of mine taught me this. He said, oh, when he was looking at one plan, he said, oh, is this real money or Excel money? <laughs> and I said, okay, seems to be Excel money. So, you know, like... Um, there is this thing of rounding, and if you really give a projection that in three years' time you know by the penny how much your uh, revenue is going to be, it goes back to the drawing board immediately. So um, you, I, I like doing scenarios. So instead of sort of a building this strategy, we do this, 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 and step by step, I prefer in a startup phase really sort of saying, okay, this is what we are starting to do because the why, and this is how we are going to do it. And then we look at different scenarios, and then we also kind of think, well, what are the milestones? Like, you know, by that, you know, after six months, what should we have achieved, and what shall we look at then, and then make new decisions? It's like sailing to me. It's sort of a, you know, you know that that's where I'm going to go, but you have to go with the wind, but you are not drifting you are taking advantage of the wind. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, here I'm here to I'm here to discuss. Yes. I, I was wondering if you ever had this. Um, I was reading a case study about like a startup. Was it Kipling, the bags, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how the owners who started it they had a really tough time when mm -hmm. it was bought. Yes. To let go of the baby that they had made together. Did you ever go through this, and how did you feel about it? Um. I have been lucky in the sense that my father, as I said, was a very good mentor to me. And uh, even at the time when I decided that I will never be an entrepreneur, but he was talking. We, my family comes from Karelia, so I have very close ties already to the fact that the, the ones who don't know Finnish history, Karelia is the part that after the Second World War, Russia took over. So both my parents had gone through having to leave everything then going back there and having to leave everything for the second time. So, you know, first of all, that was the kind of thing that I lived through, that, that things can change. And that, to me, is ingrained. It's in my backbone. I, I kind of know, because 
it was so close. It had happened to my parents already and so on. So that was one thing. And the other thing that my father always taught me, he said, you know, remember one thing, a shroud has no pockets. And that's one of the best things that I feel that I got from him. Because we have one life. So a shroud you can't, you, you don't have pockets with that. So he taught to me that, that, you know, think of the time is the thing that you have the most limited amount of. So for me, I've loved, I loved growing the company. But as I said, uh, again, I'm not saying that this is the right answer. My way of seeing it is that the company grows and the company starts growing and having its own life and so on. It's not me. Being an entrepreneur, it's not an ego trip. I know that there are entrepreneurs who do that and fine, they can do it and they can be wildly successful. But to me, it's like you see the company grow. The best things for me have been when I've seen the company grow, also when I've seen the people grow and really start, l uh, they really learn things. And uh, I was, a couple of times I've said, so what was the greatest success at Trantex for you? And, and to me, it still is the fact that 10 years after the company was sold, every year, a group of 70 to 90 people got together and had a marvelous time because they had worked with the company. And neither I or nor my husband was the one who invited them together. And the other great success for me is that every single person who has worked for the company over the years, and there were more than the 250 because, you know, there were students and so on. If I meet them now, I don't have to kind of go and say, oh my God, that's that person, let me get out of here. So even though we disagreed, and I'm not saying that, oh, we were all happy family and so on, but there is this feeling of, oh, okay, there it was all in all a positive experience. So going back to, yes, I know that people make it like, this is my baby. But there I would say that when you, <laughs> as an entrepreneur, yes, you have to love the company, but it is not your baby. I have a 10-year-old daughter, and would I ever compare her to a company? No. <laughs> um, and also, I think that it's a very important point that you touch, because I've seen also too many companies fail because the owner, the founder, could not let go and could not appreciate the talent of others who should have come and taken the company to the next level. And those, to me, are really sad because, yeah, it's valuable, but it's still, it's a separate entity. And there are many, especially when it's a growth company, it's not you. It's not about you. And uh, you just, you need to let go. Many times people say, yeah, that's, that's the toughest part. But to me, it's if you start from the very beginning as looking at it as a separate entity. If it is your ego that you are putting there, then it will be tough. But I advise you to think that <gasps> don't make it as an extension of your ego. Things change. Yeah. Hmm? Uh -huh. Actually, I have two questions. Is yeah, it not fine. too much? Okay. okay. Uh, Hello, Kaya. Hi. Thanks for the talk. And uh, my question is related to the shareholders agreement. Mm -hmm. I would like to know when do you think it's the best time to, to do it? Um, early, first of all. Um, before you have um, put the papers in of the company for uh, between the founders. Um, and early in the sense that, you know, when you start incorporating the company, and if there is a group, I mean, if, if you are the first person to incorporate the company, then you incorporate the company, and then when you start growing the team. But um, immediately when you have more than one shareholder, yes, I would advise you, before you kind of say, okay, now you are, I'm going to sell shares to you or so on, I would do it early. And as I said, again, D I'm not saying, oh, do a 60-page. There are these basic shareholder agreements that you can look from the net and so on. And if you look at some of them, they are like 30 pages long and they have all kinds of things and so on. And basically, I, I say that, hey, in the beginning, two pages should be quite enough. You don't go into every detail. The, the, one, the things that you have to define is, okay, if you leave, if somebody 
or let's say if a shareholder leaves saying, okay, that's it, you know, now my life has changed or whatever, and if he or she leaves, what will happen to the shares? Is he or she obliged to sell them back or offer them to sell back? And then the company or the other shareholders can say, hey, you're a nice guy, you can keep it. And what proportion can he keep? And typically you will give like maybe a period of two or three years or sometimes even five years that, okay, after first year, if you leave within a year, you are obliged to offer everything back. And then after that, you keep, uh, get to keep uh, a portion of your ownership. And after three years, you keep it all because you have worked for the company and so on. So those kinds of structures, because that will solve the problem of free riding. And also, as simple as possible price for selling them back. I have seen cases where the price was so unambiguously defined that only person who got rich was the lawyer because it went on like the argument went on and in court and so on. So make, I mean, I have said that, okay, you know, same price that you paid plus 5% uh, interest or 10% interest for every year because startups is about, you know, working hard together and really being in the same boat. And somebody can say it's harsh, but look, you know, if you, if you are going to be in the same boat, you know what you are doing. If somebody leaves, and then if, if you have this, that okay, there's somebody that the other shareholders say, hey, look, you know, this is not working, and you have to go. You have to define, is there a way that a given majority can say to one shareholder, for example, that okay, you need to go, and how will that shareholder then sell back the shares? And then the two other things, tag along, drag along. Do you know what tag along, drag along means? It means that if a certain percentage of shareholders gets an offer to sell, they are obliged to drag the others along and tag the others along so that then the, the rest, for example, you can say if 80% of the shareholders decide to sell the company, they are obliged to get the buyer to buy even the rest 20% out at the same price. And the 20% cannot stop them from selling. And this Take this seriously, please, because I have heard and seen, and I've been lucky, haven't been in a situation like that, but once very close. Uh, but I know of situations where a person who owned like half a percent of the shares killed a wonderful, marvelous deal, which everybody, there was a buyer, and the buyer said, I'll buy the company, and everybody would have been really happy. And that half percent shareholder who had not worked for the company practically a single day, destroyed the whole deal by saying, I'm not selling at that price, I want a higher price. And that was that. So these kinds of things, you may not think of that, but they are incre incredibly nasty if they come up. So always the tag along, drag along uh, course, so that a small minority cannot stop the others from selling if there is a good offer. Of course, they have to get the same price, but those kinds of things. As I said, luckily enough, this has gotten much, much, much better. But yeah, do and do it early. Because then everybody knows where they are getting into. And as I said, it's also a good asset test. Because if you can't agree on the shareholders' agreement, there's a chance that you can't agree on other things either. So, you know, simple things. Those are the, those are the four things, main things, and then the rest later. Yes, you had a second question. Yeah, I had a second question. It, it related to the focus that you mentioned in the fourth point, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, when wha what do you do when you have different customer groups and the uh, kind of service ah. you are trying to build, mm -hmm. it relies on those two groups to survive? Okay. Um, focus means that, you know, um, you have to prioritize what you can do and what you can execute. So it doesn't mean that, okay, there will only be one customer group forever and so on. But if you are a team of four and you know that you know, these, this is the amount of hours we can do and, and code that we can write or whatever. If you are a small team, I guarantee you that you cannot serve a very large variety of different types of customers. So focus means that, okay, do the things that you can execute and execute those well. And even though it's damn hard 
kind of say, okay, we just can't take this customer now, or we can't go to that group now. Some t you have to make those choices, and sometimes you make wrong choices. Sorry, that's the reality too. But the worst is that you try to do five different things and fail in all of them because you don't have the bandwidth to do it, and you, you are just running from one place to another. It's much better than to say, okay, you know, fine, we have to let those three areas go, and now we do only the two. Or if you don't have the resources to do the two, you have to choose the one, because it's you will you will for sure fail if you ha you if you are totally under resourced and you try to work with too many. Eventually, you will. There's no way out of that. But when you choose the focus, you have a chance of succeeding, and then you can expand. But I think that. The, the one slide that I said that there's never enough time and there's never enough resources, that is life in a, star in a growth startup. And, and which is why I also strongly recommend that we talk about growth companies and the importance of growth companies. And yes, they are important and growth is fun. But hey, it's absolutely okay if you have a company where, you know, either it's you, and, and sometimes it's very good to have a company alone. And you can provide a service where you can provide good quality service and you're happy and you have good quality of life. Or there are a couple of you and you can provide that service. The world will change around you. So you have to follow what's going on because no one can guarantee that, okay, this will go on for 10 years or 20 years. Probably the world will change within the year. So you still have to follow that. But Growth is not like the only uh, way to succeed. Not necessarily. You can, if you have great business which gives good profits and so on, it's still very, very good for you, for the national economy, because you are sort of <laughs> employing yourself and paying, paying for your family and so on and everybody. So um, there are many types of growth. And as I said, I, for one, I don't want to overemphasize this that everything is about growth 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 because it is hard and managing growth is hard and and we we need companies who provide good quality service with a more moderate growth on that note kaya thank you so much my pleasure it was nice being here i hope that you know i as i said i oh. don't give answers but i hope that you if you got one idea i'm glad and if you on one day in the companies that you start, think that, well, why not? Then I'm going to be really pleased. I like that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kaya. Thank you.